Sorry? <coughs> Everything is old. You know, a bald head is like a great radiator. And I get chilly really easily. Patrick, you're getting there. Yeah. You may have to start wearing a hat soon. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody else? Too young to worry about that. Comes on you quick. Yeah. And the Rogaine doesn't help. Try it for years. Costco, you can buy it. It's a pretty good price. What's that? Yeah, it was bulk. Yeah. It's not sponsored by Rogaine. It's all whiskey. Well, he did just say it doesn't work. It doesn't work, yeah. Yeah. If they're Okay, welcome to lecture 16. Uh, today we're going to talk about purines, and as you can tell by the blank nature of the board, you're going to be doing most of the work today. And uh, so hopefully we'll get some hearty audience participation. And based on the lecture we had yesterday, you, you should be experts at doing this type of thing. And um, in the following five lectures after this, uh, pretty much on Monday we'll be talking about some really high order heterocycles that have m multiple heteratoms in a five-member ring. And then after that, we'll get into um, topics like benzodiazepines, alkaloid biosynthesis, some random things about heterocyclic chemistry that we didn't talk about. Um, so this may be the highest point that we cover in terms of uh, uh, these types of fused heterocycles. We will cover bridging heterocycles on Monday, so it may be even a little bit the same complexity as today. Um, and so I hope what you learn from today is not how to make a pur purine. Of course you'll learn that. You may already know it. Um, but what you'll learn is that uh, the key to becoming master's black belt in heterocyclic chemistry is having a mastery over optionality. So that during the ideation phase of a medicinal or process chemistry program, you know all the options on the table from a 10,000 foot standpoint, okay? So today we'll cover various ways of making these ring systems. Sometimes there'll be three, four ways of making it. 
and uh, sometimes there'll be no clear-cut winner, and sometimes there will be a direct winner that you can tell right away, which is the right one, to, uh, right way to go. So that's what hopefully you'll get out of this uh, class today. It's a lot of strategy, and not so much on specific tactics, although we will cover that too. Okay, so the, how do you make purines? Well, there's basically two main ways you're going to see. Uh, and it basically stems from what we've been doing over and over in this class. Do you break ring A first, or do you break ring B first? If you break ring A first, and you decide we're going to start with an amino imidazole and fuse onto it some sort of formic acid oxidation state, that's kind of the way nature biosynthesizes curing, according to the biochemistry textbooks. And if you go to the right, the trial base of this is that is you're going to break up the imidazole and make a pyrimidine and build that on, again, with the formic acid oxidation state. That's also a widely used way of, make, of making purines and related compounds. Now, if you remember the book chapter we covered yesterday briefly, and sort of the rules of engagement of five, six fused systems, which one do you make first? Uh, you'll note here that it's fairly nebulous because we've got two nitrogens in the five-membered ring, two nitrogens in the uh, six-membered ring. Neither is contiguous. Both are debatable which one is more aromatic depending on your substituents. And so in these types of purine cases, it's a toss-up in many cases. There's no real clear guideline. So if you don't know how to disconnect both ways, you're going to be sunk. Now, the final way of making purines, which is rather boutique method, is through cycloaddition, uh, largely pioneered in the Bugger group. Uh, it's a really useful way of making specific types of purines, but not going to be something you often see in daily medchem, and wouldn't be the go-to method that uh, you would necessarily think of, but you should keep it in your back pocket. Okay, so the, the origins of purines, I mean, they're, they're kind of important for life, on Earth at least. And um, there's a lot of folks studying origin of life. And so the only problem of the day, before we get into the case studies, is the sort of uh, epic experiment they did many years ago, where when you take um, formamide and you heat it up to 170 degrees for a long time, uh, you get out purine. So in order to solve this problem, first thing we need to think about are what types of things you might get when you take formamide and you heat the living daylights out of it. Tanner, any ideas on just anything? Any building blocks you might get are just heating it up. Almost nothing you say can be wrong. Um, condensation. Well, before you do that, what's just going to happen with, let's just say you take formamide, uh, form uh, formamide and you just heat it up. Spontaneously, it's going to give you what? Besides condensation. Let's think about the building blocks we have in our hand, aside from formamide. We've got other things, too, because when you heat it up, it's going to decompose to stuff. What stuff is that? Um, we lose H2. If we lose H2, uh, that will give us... You're probably going to lose water as well, right? So let, let's let's put some water there. Uh, sure, I'll give you some H two. Oh, thanks. Yeah, if you heard a loud thump in Florida, it's because the uh, microphone dropped. Sorry. If you excise water from there, you can imagine that maybe there's some. HCN limit liberated. You might even be able to draw a mechanism to get rid of some CO. So we got all these various building blocks in addition to formamide that are just floating around. Now let's go back to purine. Is there a unit of one of these things you can trace within the molecule of purine? Ideas, Max? Yeah, I think it's maybe C2 nitrile equivalents. You see a couple of nitrile equivalents. I see 
uh, a lot of nitrile equivalents. yield of this is about 0.1 percent. And uh, it's very easy to imagine how you can go from this to sentient life forms that argue and teach heterocyclic chemistry. So that explains the origin of life. Well, at least that's what they think. Now, uh, on the topic of origin of life, we're going to be covering this a little bit more when we talk about the case studies from the Eschen-Moser lab. And uh, his deep question of why did nature choose one type of purine and not another? And he's been obsessed with that uh, for the past 30 years. Okay, so with that, let's begin with the case studies. So you've had plenty of time to mull this over. These have all been on the board for a couple hours, an hour and a half. And so we're expecting some vigorous participation. So almost nothing you say is wrong. All we need you to do is suggest something. So what do you say, Zhang? Why don't you start us off today? We can um, take A and we can go to B, or we can go to B and, and build on A. Which one do you want? Uh, let's build on B. From A? Yeah. OK. So an intermediate we would need then That's what you would draw from that analysis, correct? Yep. Uh, now, in the closure from here to here, do you anticipate any issues? Like uh, regioselectivity problems. You're, you're very likely to have regioselectivity issues. So do you want to alter this answer? Of oh, like the different constituents. Of the yeah, how do, how do we want to make the regiochemistry work? So one option would be not going to do it. We can't take a 1,3 dicarbonyl here with an amino directly yeah. and react that with formamidine because the amides just don't condense. Right, yeah. So we need an equivalent of that. Equivalent. Uh, the, which one equivalent? A nitrile, some type of nitrile. I'm going to come back to you for nitrile. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when we're ready for nitrile, believe me, I'm coming straight for you. Uh, Vince, any alternative, um, any ways of making this guy quickly? I guess instead of using amines, you can go from the amines. You can go from the amines, but then I need a way to, like if I want a cassette, cassette approach to dump in various amines, Certainly, you don't want me to take a triamino pyrimidine and start trying to regioselectively alkylate it, do you? No. No. Just have a chloramethyl and one of the positions do SIR and do that after you've closed the bicycle. So, option one would be to do what Zhang says and um, 
add in your two amines, then reduce. One of them is protected and then deprotect at the end. You'll find things like that in literature. Option two would be to do what Saul says, where you add in one amine, reduce the nitro down, close, and then add in methylamine. Now, the problem with that, <clears throat> first, the tri that triamino pyrimidine is going to be a beast. It's going to be pretty electron rich. Um, the next problem with it is that now you have to do a regioselective arylation here, and you don't want to touch the amine here. You don't want to touch the amine here. It's going to be a regiochemical nightmare. So I would not recommend the triamino. You have so many options on your plate, do not do that. Let's draw a line in the sand and just say, don't propose triamino pyrimidines. Even if you might find some old Russian paper where they did something like that, I doubt you will. I've looked. Uh, don't do it. It's a good suggestion, but I'm glad we voiced it. Don't do it. How do we make this thing? Talked about this a few lectures ago. Tucker, can you remind us? PSCL3. And this just comes back a lot of for me. Remember, we this is straight out of like a few lectures ago when we could talk about primitives. Take the malinate with a nitro in between, add that to formamidine acetate, you'll get out that, then POCL3. Alternatively, you could, if you don't have the nitromalinate, you could just use malinate, nitrate that, and then POCL3, both just fine. Okay, this is not the answer. There's another answer, too. So, uh, Jess, wh what do we need if we're going to start the other way? I'm going to need to draw an imidazole, clearly. And I guess that what I need is a substituent on the imidazole. What do you want me to put here? Well, if I got cy cyano, I'll have to do reductive emanation at the end. Might be easier to just have some ester, perhaps, and then add PLCL3, and then add in. So let's just put E here. Or it can be, yeah, E is fine. And then the bottom? Uh, you could use chloride. Or another option? Zeng? It must be time for a nitrile, <laughs> uh, because that carbon we need to put here in amine. So when you're thinking about this strategically, I would rather do a condensation with a formate equivalent than to do an SNAR and then do that. So an SNAR on an imidazole, even with electron withdrawing group, it's annoying. Why not just have the amine to begin with and then do a condensation? Right? So Although it's sort of correct, Jess, it's better to have the amine there, because then you can just cyclize and lose water. OK, now we need a way of making that. And Zhang already gave us the clue. If we've got an amine there, we're going to need a nitrile. And we need a regioselective way of making this, which is challenging. And so when you're thinking about the regioselective method, you're going to want to think about how do you excise out that unit altogether? because we don't want to do sodium hydride and benzyl bromide, because it's going to go here and here. Right? We learned this already. So the way they do it is instead of having E, they're just using amide. And we already learned how to make that. There you go. <clears throat> Complete.
complete reach selectivity. Do you think this approach is fundamentally better than starting from like n benzyl forming a mid and the same? So if we start from uh, that, and then you want to do what? Basically, I'll, you see what I'm doing. I'm cleaving a different. CC yeah. So you'll make this intermediate here, like that, and then react it with this. Uh, uh, react it. React it with the same. The amino. The same starting material that you already drew. Oh. The amino. Should give you the same region, right? Yeah. It's equivalent. It's the same. Yeah. Sure. It's easier in practice to make that intermediate because then I can add 100,000 of these and make my library. But yeah, what Saul said is fine. If you want to just take this amine and add it into this amino ether, yeah, well, it's no, no problem there. Same thing. You intercept the same intermediate. Right? When the amine adds in here to this, you, you get the same thing that Saul had from the addition there. Good. Yeah, it's great. Which one's better? Depends on the context. Who knows? Depends on the ARs, depends on the substituents. You need to know both. Okay, how about this next one? Now we have a thiazole linked to a pyrimidinone, an amino pyrimidone. So, Chang, which one do you want to start with? You would rather have B and annulate onto it A. Okay, so we're going to go. <laughs> and uh, the substituents you're going to need here. You want to draw something similar to what we had above? And how do I make that little thing? So which bond do you want to break? Let's uh, just clean up what um, let's see if we got this right. Something like this. I'm just trying to understand what you're drawing, Cheng. Yeah, something like this. How do you make that? Does that feel good to you? That doesn't feel good to to me either. What, what did you say, Vince? Um, instead of having that, what you just drew and erased, having that as SCN. Okay, that sounds good. And uh, how do we make that thing? Too many aminos here.
Procyon's going to be your estimate. Something like this? Or maybe a more realistic reagent would be Either. You make carbons four and two nitriles and then treat with S8. Just remove this amino altogether, since it's an amino thiazole. And imagine that comes from a nitration of this. So, nitration reduction. And then this is straight out of the thiazole lecture. That might give it to you. All right, I think we've pontificated enough on this. We'll return to it in a moment. Why don't we go to the opposite strategy? So the opposite strategy would require a couple of substituents. what Vince said. That should spontaneously cyclize, don't you think? You can't make the actual thiazole. That's, that's too, too... It's only going to attack the nitrile. So as whereas yesterday we saw these things attack at sulfur, if you can't attack at sulfur, you're going to have to attack at carbon. So this could be a viable intermediate. And where might that come from? Well, one option. This is coming back to something which you should be more comfortable with. That looks like a, a POCl3, one equivalent. Same thing we saw up here, adding guanidine. One equivalent of POCl3 gives us that. What's a good What's a good source of thiol? We've got H2S, but another one that's really good that you see often in the literature is thiourea. So thiourea can add into this as well. Do an SNAR, and that intermediate uh, species you get with hydroxide rapidly adds in water and loses off urea. 
So you extract the sulfur from thiourea to make urea, just by taking thiourea and sodium hydroxide. Now, on the test, if you put H2S, it's fine. You get what you mean. But in practice, when people do this, you often see in these papers people using thiourea. Now we have to find a way to reduce this nitro uh, down to the amine. How do, how do we do that? Can we use palladium? Uh, uh, how about, how about uh, um, nickel? Iron filings, tin 2. Iron filings, tin 2. Zinc acetic acid. Maybe, yeah. <clears throat> but if you want a guaranteed way to reduce the nitro group that's not going to touch the sulfur, you don't want to have to think about it. Uh, a good reagent to use, and we, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about um, benzoxazoles. I believe that's when it, we talked about it. <clears throat> Remember this little reducing agent. It's super useful. So very selectively, we'll add in there. It'll then kick out HSO3 or NaSO3 to make the nitro so, and then do it again to liberate the amine. Super convenient way to reduce nitros and not touch anything else that might be offensive. OK, questions? Yeah, what do you say there, Dongman? Can you directly do SNAR with thiocyanate instead of going to thiocyanate? You could, and the, but the, the reason they don't do that is because it's a very um, labile compound, and it doesn't withstand the conditions of any reduction. So that's why they need to make the thiol amine and then react that with cyanogen bromide. Great question. Why did they get bromination on the thiol as opposed to the... Bromination on the thiol? Or sorry, sorry, cyanation. Well, it might be on the, on the amino. It doesn't matter. Either one is fine. I mean, I drew this out just for, you know, logic made it easier for you to think about. But if I put the CN there, that's fine too. It's a good question. Probably the thiol adds. But even if the amino adds, it doesn't matter. Same product. Good question. Now, oh, before we move on, do you, do you like uh, the top one better than the bottom one? Elena, what do you think? What do you prefer? Top one it feels a little better, right? I always hate dealing with thiazoles, especially aminothiazoles. They're a real pain in the butt, practically speaking. Not very soluble. They're a bit of a pain. So yeah, the top one is probably, from a pragmatic perspective, better. But you'll find the bottom example in literature as well, depending on the context. OK, how about three? Three is an interesting one. It's a purine that is missing a nitrogen. So Sarah, why don't you give us some thoughts on this one? Um, what do you prefer? OK, great. We're going to start from B, and we're going to build A onto it. And that's going to require. Make that? No. Probably want to avoid it. Yeah. Even if we use some conceptual equivalent of that, like putting some halogen atoms in a specific location, you've got a um, tetra substituted pyridine. It could be fine, right? But if you were sort of brainstorming, my knee jerk reflex would be to go the other way. So if we go the other way,
this would be the building block we need, right? Right, Zhang? Is that good? It's perfect. Perfect. Now, how do you make that thing? We have a midazole experts. Let's find them. Who are they? Oh, here they are. Chang and Nick. Well, Nick is nowhere to be found, so that leaves you, Chang. And amido amid is all at that. If there's anybody who should know this, it's you. Just cut it to bonding. Okay, that sounds great. Now, a note on this. Um, we have a nitrile here, but if we have an E here, that's fine too, because these two are easily differentiable. And so in practice, it's very easy to treat this S diester with ammonia. It goes to the primary amide here before it touches this very electron-rich one, and then dehydrate to get the nitrile. Okay? So that's fine. Now, in practice, this is great for the test. Perfect. This is the disconnection they wrote in the paper. Doesn't work. It's perfect. Any other thoughts? Saul, you have an idea? Why doesn't it work? What they get it? If you look at the original paper, they have an arrow with an X on it. It's a J Med Chem paper, I believe. That's the best you're going to get. Why doesn't it work? Um, I mean, it is, a, it, it is a tricky condensation. Guanoline is never a fun nucleophile to use, especially with an alpha halo compound, right, Cheng? Yeah. So we can flip her into an electrophile as a Cyanamide? We're going to see that a lot today, so thanks for introducing cyanamide to us. Sure. Uh, that's great. Definitely, you, you, you would draw it on paper. On the test, it's fine. Sure, it might have problems with self condensation, particularly, that's going to be an issue. So, you'd have to have something in the E that is protected somewhat. You need to be cognizant of that. It's problematic. Can we install nitrile? Cyanide Through some sort of benzylic bromination followed by. That's a great idea. So one can imagine everything coming from that. Benzylic bromination, sodium cyanide addition. Sure. Making that may rectify the problem that Saul had. So the alpha amino ketone in that case may be fine. Uh, sketch out for me where the, oh, uh, there's an, a cyanide here and the other cyanide is here? No, so the one that you just drew and our current cyanide, yeah. So the one that's alpha, it's, or I guess beta to the current cyanide. And then you use that alpha position next to the ester to add in. and then add it into some sort of electrophile up here? That's what you need to do. Oh. It's going to be a little bit yeah, of a challenge. I to use it as an electrophile. It's probably not going to work. Not a good electrophile. Let's imagine for a moment that the target of all of this
over that. Benzoyl protected. Okay? And let's imagine for a moment that there were a magical way to connect that. Oxidiazole. We haven't talked about those yet. We, we, we will on Monday. Let's imagine we treated this thing with base. That would give you that. It's a Kitritsky rearrangement. Now the nice thing, this works in high yield. The really cool thing about this is that all we need now is that plus so we need to come up with a way of making an oxidizole. Amino imidazole. If you see amino imidazole, you can start thinking about this Katritsky like strategy. And you need some sort of enamine intermediate. So you don't necessarily need that at all. And from here, you can excise um, a molecule of benzoyl chloride. So if we treat that with a little bit of dehydrating agent or acid, it should be fine. And uh, we will learn all about these types of oxidizoles tomorrow. You can make it from this, or you can also make it from the corresponding acylated guanoline by treating this with hydroxylamine. Both ways are fine. People often prefer to do it through the intermediacy of the acyl guanide versus this one, just due to the instability of that compound versus making it in situ from the acyl guanide. All right. That gets us to case study number four. which Hannah has nicely volunteered to give us a disconnection. What feels better to you? There's no wrong answer. What do you want? Disconnect A from B. Okay. So you're going to make A, uh, B, and then annulate on. Okay. Less. Why did you prefer that route, instinctively, in like a microsecond? Last time you told me I couldn't have a trimino <laughs> so. I well, but there are other options to get away from a triamino pyrimidine. Just felt better. One reason it might have felt better to you is because of the CF3 group. Yeah. Well, 
if you imagine uh, a menisci like trifluoromethylation, you've got a competition between that position and that position. And yeah, is it? Cheap What's that? Oh, so you're going to give us the other disconnection too. You want, the, let's do the other one. I mean, if we just go back to case study number one and copy it verbatim. And then what was the intermediate you said? An equivalent to that would be taking trifluoroacetonide trial and making the amidine of it, and then doing that, just like we did in case study number one. Same thing. It's not as good, just because this is not a great nucleophile, but there is a JOC paper where they do this. So you can do it. You can propose it, and you can actually do it in the lab. So that disconnection is just fine. Back to this one. I think we might have covered it already. There, there it is. Same. Here it is, right here. So we've covered this already. It's a viable disconnection. We have covered this already. It's a viable disconnection. Both are fine. I don't know which one you would necessarily choose. It might depend on the substituent here, or it might depend in a MedChem campaign on where the diversity is coming from. So, for instance, if you want to run the campaign and screen all the SAR around fluoro substituents here, making a boatload of this and then condensing is probably much better than each analog making this compound and then doing SARs, right? So that's why you need to know both. When you get in the trenches, the SAR may tell you to go one place or another. Keep something constant. Okay, how about uh, case study number five? Now we have a tricyclic ring system. So this one is going to be tricky. Let's see who we got here we haven't heard from. Well, there's always Gigi, who's not going to hesitate to give us a suggestion here. You want to break B and uh, turn it into what to build? What building block? You want to what? X size what? So interesting disconnection. How do we get that sulfur in there? And how do we get it selectively and not on the really great electrofuge you've got here? So if you could make this intermediate, this would snap shut like crazy. Agreed? Yes. But I don't know how you would necessarily make that super quickly. If we focus on ring B for a moment, um, what about, Gigi, what do you think of this intermediate? How 
about that one? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a shame. Hmm. All right, how about this one? This one has certainly got to be good. Aha, how about that? <laughs> Say that again, Jay? <laughs> yeah, hmm. Damn it. How if we build ring C? We do for building A. Yep. We do a gawalt amino thiophene and then do a courteous and then that amino snapshot. And then you could do like maybe POCO3 and burn off your oxidation. Like this, see? Yeah, something like that. So if we take this further, Steve's suggestion is to add that in, then that should snap shut to this, then doing a courteous should immediately snap shut to that through the isocyanate intermediate, and all we need to do is find a way to make that, which um, I assume we could just take trichloropyrimidine, add in one equivalent of cyanide, and then add in the equivalent of ammonia. Is it viable on paper? I think so. What do you say, TH? Will we give credit on the test for that? Why not? What if we go the opposite way? So Steve's suggestion seems totally viable. But what if we break ring C? Do the same Steve maneuver. Or this can be, in the case of what they actually did, bromine. We can do the same thing, right, Steve? So work fine. Add in our same Kowal nucleophile. selectivity uh, in the cyanation step with copper? Do we need selectivity? Sorry? Do we need selectivity? You, maybe you're done. That's a good point. Yeah. You're going to deprotect it anyway. Um, so you don't. But if you're curious where it goes, it's going to go here. And then this just comes back from Start with the midazole tribromination. Protection is the end vinyl. 
halogen metal exchange with uh, Grignard quenched with water. It only goes in C2. That gives you the Zybromo. But um, which route is better? I mean, I think this one is actually a contender for being just as good. What do you say, Pavel? Why cyanide goes there? But that probably. <clears throat> it's not too sterically bulky. They're just using N vinyl. And um, it's pyro like, so I suspect that the under almond like conditions there's an easier time of uh, doing the oxidative addition into that, you know, just like halogen metal exchange is easier on C2 position of a thiophene or a protected pyrrole, it's probably for that reason, whereas this position is a lot more electron rich. Good question. Any other questions? All right, Elena, it's your turn. Problem number six. This time, I've taken a carbon, and if you go to the front page of the handout, I've taken a carbon, or they have, out of the purine, where normally there's a, a nitrogen right here, sorry, a nitrogen out of the purine, and replace that nitrogen with a carbon. So this J Med Chem paper, note that the R group is not any R group. It's a, as a sugar. So your retrosynthetic analysis needs to be tied to that fact very closely. Uh, what's the second? B? You're going to break B? So you're going to take A and annulate onto it B, which is going to give us something like that. Any thoughts on a viable way to break that up? Let's label the bonds. That's a good idea. <clears throat> so let's think about that for a moment. If we're to break up melanonitrile, you kind of need to have an amino here, I guess. Right? So if we do what Elena said, we're going to need to use something like this. in here somehow and then when we get that exchange to give you the enamine then that somehow adds in there the way you're thinking is perfect it's not exactly the way they did it but when I show you it's just a sort of um, pragmatic derivative of what you just suggested it's going to be easier to add an amine into this through addition elimination than it is to sort of try to make an enamine from that hidden aldehyde. So you can just add that in directly and then treat it with base and it cyclizes to give that product. And this comes from the as a sugar by treating with triethyl orthoformate followed by addition 
cyclization, and done. But is that the best way to make it? I don't know. Let's find out. What if we take B and instead go to A? What would that require? Maybe something like this? Yes? I mean, we gotta, we got to put an indole or a pyrrole, however you want to think about it. You can think about doing Fisher, but it's going to be hard to make necessarily out of hydrazine. Any issues with the cyclization here? Yeah. What, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you get condensation instead of... Like, Could be condensation up here. Yeah. So it's a pretty electron deficient position. It may not cyclize the way you want, perhaps, or may, but it's probably going to condense. And then we've got to make an alpha halo as a sugar. So that, that intermediate is just not as good. So I'd much rather just take an as a sugar, oxidize to the imine, and then add it in a acetonitrile. Right? That's how you make that. Just break that bond right there. So the retrosynthesis is really guided primarily by the ease with which you can take an as a sugar and homologate it somehow. All right, so to Eschimoser we go. So uh, in nature, the thought was that it's possible nature makes these two six diamino prearine type species. And uh, he was obsessed for many years on what he called the etiology of DNA and RNA and why, it, why did nature choose what she did and are there other correct answers to the puzzle. And as part of this, he did a lot of deep chemistry with uh, Ram, who's here, professor here. And um, it was a lot of fun having Eschimoser here during those days. Quite, quite an intellectual giant. Pretty amazing uh, person. Anyway, he's still around. He's back at the Etaha as an emeritus professor there. And um, anyway, during his time at Scripps, these are some of the chemistries he did. And so he wondered uh, the natural form of taking a amino imidazole and condensing with cyanamide would give a species like this. But he wondered if it's just going to be a cyanamide-type condensation, why didn't nature cyclize at nitrogen instead of carbon, which would give these isomeric species? And so in order to make these types of things and interrogate their biological incorporation properties, he had to actually de design a route. So in an epic series of three back-to-back -back orglet papers, he illustrated the synthesis of this compound, compound 8, and compound 9. So first, let's talk about this rather bizarre heterocycle. It's a triazine. No, it's an imidazole. Don't know which one it is. It's both. Tejo, any thoughts on where you want to start? Okay, disconnect ring B. So we're going to make A and annulate on B, which is going to give us our starting amino imidazole plus something like trying to trace out something like that, correct? So sort of taking diacyanamide and just condensing it with the amino imidazole. How do we make the amino imidazole? This is a pretty air and, and uh, air and moisture sensitive imidazole, so it needs to be nitrated, reduced, and used immediately in crude form. And um, 
it can be condensed with cyanamide under acidic conditions to give a pitifully poor yield of product. So maybe let's take a look at the other way of making it. If we disconnect A and build it from AB, we would need something that looks like this. Correct? All right. How do we make that? Of course, everybody wants to start with this. The medicinal chemist's favorite first scaffold. Add in three nucleophiles. Ammonia, ammonia, and then what's the third one, Pavel? Cyanide. Cyanide, and then try to reduce the thing and then formulate it. Going to have to formulate it selectively, which is probably OK. Certainly one possibility. Uh, the other one, which is what they use to give reasonably good yield of product, was just to take formal glycine plus, and Cheng, you're going to love this. Iguanide. You may laugh and say, oh, here he goes teaching us useless things again. But actually, biguanide can be made fairly practically just by taking urea, making the corresponding amino ether, and then treating that with guanidine and you can make yourself some nice biguanide. It might be explosive, so don't do a scale up of this. I suspect biguanide isn't energetic. But on a small scale, it's probably fine. And in practice, that's the way they did it, larger scale, uh, and it actually worked, whereas the cyanamide strategy shown here did not. OK, how about problem? Number eight from the next Eschen Moser paper. The biguanide strategy probably doesn't make so much sense here. And so for eight, we probably want to be wedded to a strategy that uses amino imidazole. And if you take the first bond you can break, the intermediate you would end up with I suppose could look something like that. But that may be somewhat difficult to access. So instead, they use the conceptual equivalent to this. What is the equivalent to this? Well, it would require that instead, you have an omethoxy here, which you can then just hydrolyze off at the end. And maybe we can put the board over there, guys. And then this thing comes from an intermediate you can get your hands on, plus a 
and that does work. And then finally, the same logic can be applied to case study nine. We're going to start again with the amino midazole. And the intermediate we want to intercept would look like this. Some bizarre building blocks I'm showing you here, but these are real. Questions? We're doing great on time. The final case study, before we get into some uh, bonus topics is this simple looking creature that is a purine like thing but instead of a pyrimidine imidazole it is a pyrazine imidazole so let's see who we have here how about uh, Ziki Sorry, I can barely hear you. And same thing we did with what? And then what do you want me to do, Ziki? That looks good. You can find some random papers online where they actually make that compound. It's unclear how exactly they do it in reasonable yield. So it's, it's a findable compound. In, in practice, the way they uh, go about doing this is a direct SNAR on the amino pyrazine instead. And the amino pyrazine comes from this by treatment with POCL3. So the coupling you get here gives you which they then do a courteous on or a Hoffman degradation followed by PLCL3. It's a long-winded way to do it. If you propose the nitrochloro, that's just fine because you will find a procedure that's uninterpretable in the literature, but for full disclosure, you can also uh, find this procedure which is actually well precedented. Now the alternative disconnection would be something like that. 
we don't probably want to use a diamino imidazole. Probably the nitro chloro but might work, uh, but that's rather challenging to make. So probably this dis disconnection that Zeke gave us at the beginning is the most logical way to go. And who knows, today maybe you can even find a vendor for this stuff. Sorry? Dichloropyrimidine is available, so I assume you could nitrate that, then monodechlorination, if you're lucky. Oh, 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 I see. The you mean the dichloro here? Yeah, it's another possibility. I don't know why people don't do that. Sure. So the dichloro, add in one equivalent of ammonia, followed by adding methylamine and then cyclizing. Also, another, if you draw that in a, on an exam, that's perfect. Perfectly fine. All right, those are the 10 case studies we have. And in the final few minutes, we can talk about some other purine-esque type molecules that are rather uh, important. Uh, for example, this one called Levitra. And um, again, we've got, it's a great intro to Monday's lecture because we've got these bridging heterocycles with one of the nitrogens of the heterocycle at the ring fusion. Those are some of the most confusing for students. That's why we cover it in lecture 17 and not lecture two. But anyway, you should be able to reason out a good route to this compound without, just based on what you have right now in your hand. Tucker, any thoughts? And then something like that. Is that what you had in mind? Something like this, yes. I mean, we could also do a reductive emanation and I mean, so the other idea would be, let's just draw out exactly the intermediate we would need. Let's say that. That's pretty good there, Tucker. Now what do you want to do? Is there an intermediate from a nitrile? Remember, we, we digressed earlier this week, and we talked about all the things you can make from nitriles. Yes. So if you take a nitrile and you add in it, uh, we covered almost all the nucleophiles. What might be something in this molecule that looks like it's an adduct with nitrile that would give us almost the entire ring system? Hydrazine. Oh, thank you, Alex, in Florida. <laughs> Florida comes in with the save. The voice of God, <laughs> the voice of God yes. Right. <laughs> okay, so. Tucker, let me ask you a question. 
Do you think you could come up with that retrosynthesis so quickly uh, a month ago? Probably not. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. This is what makes it all worth it. That's how they did it on process scale. So in like t two seconds, you derived what 50 people spent 50 years, essentially man years on, of labor. That's pretty good. Very proud of you, Tucker. All right, and this just comes from the, uh, and that just comes from a simple isolation. Do those addicts have names? Sorry? Do those addicts have a name? I just need to A mydrazone. Mydrazone. Okay, what about the other route? Maybe, maybe there's another route. Well, if we break up the other way, We need something like that. Do you like aminosols with an N amino substituent? Most people do not. You can make them. We may cover an example on Monday where it's strategic, something similar to this. You need to know this disconnection. In this case, it's not going to be viable. Just because it's hard to get the regiochemistry right. So the winner is what Tucker said. All right, now we have to do radio labeling, of course. So what happens if you want to take a purine base like this with a rather bizarre exotic R group on there, and you want to make this not from scratch. If you've got 50 kilos of the API sitting here in non-labeled form, and I need you to take that as your starting material and then put a new carbon there that is labeled. Uh, what? That's an interesting idea. So. Full disclosure, uh, not very thought of, just initial first thought. some placeholders there. So the Dimroth would involve, if we added OH into here, had the thing open up, and then somehow close back down. So let's draw that. If we open this up, we need this to be something like that. Now let's try to piece together what Max is saying in the most logical way. So somehow open this up, flip it around and have it then recyclize here. Right, Max? Oh, uh, yeah. That's exactly what they did. But now we just have to think about how they did it. Just like treat with like KCM or. Sorry, say that again? Treat with like labeled sign or something. So our label is going to come from cyanamide. And in the forward direction,
make the N oxide, you then treat this with methyl iodide. Sorry, first cyanamide, then methyl iodide. And then cook that up with ethoxide. And the product you get out is that. Now you can break this NO bond through a variety of methods and then you can deaminate by nitrosylating and then getting a selectivity issue or treating it with adenine deaminase enzyme. Why the product is similar than favor? I can't hear you Cheng. It is a thermodynamic process. And you're asking why is this one, this isomer favored over this one? Because the end point of this one is a closure. So even if it's not favored, the cyanamide being attacked drives it to the end. Good question. Now, uh, you can make the diamino compound if you want. In many cases you need that compound, radio label. But in this particular study they needed the oxygen there. Why is that the N-oxide that forms? Is that what they, they treat a PLCL3 first? Uh, yeah. Well, if they treat the PSA first, you silate them, uh, the oxygen, and then activates the Jason factor. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 So the first step, apparently, is in order to address Steve's question to get the differentiation. that. And then that, Steve, thanks, explains why you get your selectivity. <coughs> More electron-rich nitrogen. But the key take-home message here for this tricky radio labeling problem is what Max got in a few microseconds. Just Dimroth it open. Now you might say, isn't it easier, Phil, to just make this radio label from the beginning and then just do a, a glycosylation? Of course. Of course it is. But if you have 50 kilos of this and the R group is something super bizarre and you don't get the right stair selectivity or something's wrong where you have to do a whole many, many steps, then you have to consider the approach where you've got unlimited quantities of starting material that you can degrade and reconstitute. That's why we need to talk about this way too. All right, and we are right on time because this one shouldn't take you more than a minute. We need to take this purine and exchange out the adenine nitrogen for a radio labeled nitrogen. We can do Sandmeyer SNAR. We can turn this into an electron deficient heterocycle, like a pyridinium salt. We can even make a uh, triazole. We can make the diazonium, as Saul said. There are many options to take an amine and turn it into a great leaving group. And that is it. We are right on time. So don't forget, 2 p.m. today, one of the greatest medicinal chemistry stories in the history of humanity so far. So see you at 2 p.m.
if it's just like oh, I find it's more awkward to just be standing here and like, looking at everything. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 